Many may still remember the 2002 martial art film directed by Zhang Yimou and starring Bai Jieli. The name is Hero, and it is based on the historical event of Jin Ke's assassination attempt on the first emperor of China, King of Qin, in 227 BC. The original story is explicitly detailed in the records of the Grand Historian, also known by its Chinese name Shi Ji. A monumental history of ancient China and the world, it was completed around 94 BC by the Western Han Dynasty official Sima Qian after having been started by his father Sima Tan, Grand Astrologer to the Imperial Court. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Claire Hennessy. In today's episode, we will explore the context and the historical value of the records of the Grand Historian. Sima Qian is a significant figure in Chinese literary history. Two points can be summed up regarding his significance. The first is that he commands among readers of Chinese a respect and admiration comparable to the accorded Herodotus or Thucydides in the Western tradition. Shi Ji covers more than 2,000 years, beginning from the rise of the legendary Yellow Emperor and the formation of the first Chinese polity to the reigning sovereign of Sima Qian's time, Emperor Wu of Han. As the first universal history of the world, as it was known to the ancient Chinese, it served as a model for official history writing for subsequent Chinese dynasties and the Chinese cultural sphere, such as Korea, Vietnam, and Japan. Up until the 20th century, the second important nature about Shi Ji is that it echoes the writer's own story. Sima Qian's father, Sima Tan, first conceived the ambitious project of writing a complete history of China, but had only completed some preparatory sketches at the time of his death. After inheriting his father's position as court historian to the imperial court. Sima Qian was determined to fulfill his father's dying wish of composing and putting together this epic work of history. However, a few years into compiling Shi Ji, in 99 BC, he fell victim into the Li Ling incident that drastically changed his course of life and shaped the ways in which the historian observed his world in Shi Ji. Below is a brief description of the incident given by Burton Watson, translator of Shi Ji, to the Anglophone readers. China at this time was frequently troubled by raids from the Shongnu, a nomadic people living in the desert north of China. Emperor Wu, determined to put an end to the incursions, repeatedly dispatched large military forces to the desert region in an attempt to capture the Shongnu ruler, known by the title of Shan Yu, or at least force him to acknowledge fealty to the Han. During one such expedition in 99 BC, a young military commander named Li Ling. Led a force of several thousand men in a daring raid deep into enemy territory, but after desperate fighting, he was finally forced to surrender. Emperor Wu, who expected his military leaders to die in battle, was enraged when he learned of the surrender. Only Su Ma Qian, who had known and admired Li Ling in the past, spoke out in his defense. For his temerity, Qian was charged with attempting to deceive the ruler and handed over to law officials for investigation. A process that involved imprisonment and torture. Eventually, he was sentenced to undergo the penalty of castration. At that time, execution could be commuted either by money or castration. Since Sima Qian did not have enough money to atone his crime, he chose the latter and was then thrown into prison, where he endured three years. He described his pain thus. When you see the jailer, you abjectly touch the ground with your forehead. At the mere sight of his underlings, you were seized with terror. Such ignominy can never be wiped away. Sima Qian called his castration the worst of all punishments. In 96 BC, upon his release from prison, Sima Qian chose to live on as a palace eunuch to complete his histories, rather than commit suicide as was expected of a gentleman scholar who had been disgraced by being castrated. As Sima Qian himself explained in his letter to Ren An, translated by Watson, "If even the lowest slave and scullion maid can bear to commit suicide, why should not one like myself be able to do what has to be done? But the reason I have not refused to bear these ills and have continued to live, dwelling in vileness and disgrace without taking my leave, is that I grieve that I have things in my heart which I have not been able to express fully, and I am ashamed to think that after I am gone." My writings will not be known to posterity. 
Too numerous to record are the men of ancient times who were rich and noble and whose names have yet vanished away. It is only those who were masterful and sure, the truly extraordinary men, who are still remembered. I too have ventured not to be modest, but have entrusted myself to my useless writings. I have gathered up and brought together the old traditions of the world which were scattered and lost. I have examined the deeds and events of the past and investigated the principles behind their success and failure, their rise and decay, in 130 chapters. I wish to examine all that concerns heaven and men, to penetrate the changes of the past and present, completing all as the work of one family. But before I had finished my rough manuscript, I met with this calamity. It is because I regretted that it had not been completed that I submitted to the extreme penalty without rancor. When I have truly completed this work, I shall deposit it in the famous mountain. If it may be handed down to men who will appreciate it and penetrate to the villages and the great cities, then though I should suffer a thousand mutilations, what regret should I have? The leading incident not only changed Sima Qian's course of life, but also affected his expression towards the violent nature of Emperor Wu's policies of the Han Dynasty. Shi Ji, especially in its relentless criticism towards the first emperor of China or Qin Shi Huang, is a de facto criticism towards Emperor Wu, who was reminiscent of the first emperor of Qin, and therefore Shi Ji is in a way not just a story about the entire Asia at the time, but also a story of the writer himself. What kind of genre or format should we call Shi Ji? Unlike his predecessors who follow a chronological order in their compositions, Sima Qian devised a new form of writing history, and this form is called Ji Zhuan Ti, which refers to the organization of the work into the following subcategories. They are basic annals, containing the biographies of the sovereigns, ordered biographies containing the biographies of influential non-nobles, and the third category is called tables, containing graphical chronologies of royalty and nobility. And a fourth is treatises, consisting of essays giving a historical perspective on various topics like music, ritual, or economics. And last but not least, house chronicles, documenting important events in the histories of the rulers of each of the quasi-independent states of the Zhou dynasty, as well as the histories of contemporary aristocratic houses established during the Han dynasty. In all, Shi Ji consists of 12 basic annals, 10 tables, 8 treatises, 30 house chronicles, and 70 ordered biographies. Shi Ji marks a significant shift in historiography as well as literary narratology. Even though Sima Qian carried the Confucian tradition, he is highly innovative in the following few aspects. To begin with, Sima Qian's work was concerned with the history of the known world. Previous Chinese historians had focused only on one dynasty or one region. Sima Qian's history of 130 chapters began with the legendary Yellow Emperor and extended to his own time, and covered not only China but also neighboring nations like Korea and Vietnam. In this regard, he is truly significant as the first Chinese historian to treat the peoples living to the north of the Great Wall, like the Xunu, as human beings who were implicitly the equals of the Middle Kingdom, instead of the traditional approach which had portrayed the Xunu as savages who had the appearance of humans but the minds of animals. As many scholars such as Tamara Chin and Nicholas D. Cosmo agree that in his comments about the Xiongnu people, Sima Qian refrained from evoking claims about the innate moral superiority of the Han over the northern barbarians that were the standard rhetorical tropes of the Chinese historians in this period. Sima Qian also broke new ground by using more sources like interviewing witnesses, visiting places where historical occurrences had happened, and examining documents from different regions and different times. Before Chinese historians had tended to use only rain histories as their sources, the Shi Ji was further very novel in Chinese historiography by examining historical events outside of the courts, providing a broader history than the traditional court-based histories had done. 
Unlike traditional Chinese historians, Sima Qian went beyond the androcentric, nobility-focused histories by dealing with the lives of women and men, such as poets, bureaucrats, merchants, comedians, jesters, assassins, and philosophers. The treatises section, the biography section, and the annals section relating to the Qin Dynasty that make up 40% of the Shiji have aroused the most interest from historians and are the only parts of the Shiji that have been translated into English. Placing his subjects was often his way of expressing obliquely moral judgments. Empress Lü and Xiang Yu were the effective rulers of China during reigns Hui of Han and Yi of Chu, respectively, so Sima Qian placed both their lives in the basic annals. Likewise, Confucius is included in the fourth section rather than the fifth, where he properly belonged as a way of showing his eminent virtue. The structure of the Shiji allowed Sima Qian to tell the same stories in different ways, which allowed him to pass his moral judgments. For example, in the basic annals section, the emperor Gaozu is portrayed as a good leader, whereas in the section dealing with his rival Xiang Yu, the emperor is portrayed unflatteringly. At the end of most of the chapters, Sima Qian usually wrote a commentary in which he judged how the individual lived up to traditional Chinese values like filial piety, humility, self-discipline, hard work, and concern for the less fortunate. Sima Qian also intended to discover the patterns and principles of the development of human history. He emphasized, for the first time in Chinese history, the role of individual man in affecting the historical development of China and his historical perception that a country cannot escape the fate of growth and decay. Unlike the Book of Han, which was written under the supervision of the imperial dynasty, Shiji was a privately written history since the author refused to write it as an official history, covering only those of high rank. The work also covers people of the lower classes and is therefore considered a veritable record of the darker side of the dynasty. In Sima Qian's time, literature and history were not seen as separate disciplines as they are now, and Sima Qian wrote his magnum opus in a very literary style, making extensive use of irony, sarcasm, juxtaposition of events, characterization, direct speech, and invented speeches, which led the American historian Jennifer Jay to describe parts of the Shiji as reading more like a historical novel than a work of history. Sima Qian has often been criticized for historicizing myths and legends, as he assigned dates to the mythical and legendary figures from ancient Chinese history together with what appears to be suspiciously precise genealogies of the leading families over the course of several millennia, including his own, where he traces the descent of the Sima family from legendary emperors in the distant past. However, Archaeological discoveries in recent decades have confirmed aspects of the Shiji and suggested that even if the sections to the Shiji dealing with the ancient past are not totally true, at least Sima Qian wrote down what he believed to be true. In particular, archaeological finds have confirmed the basic accuracy of the Shiji, including the reigns and the locations of tombs of ancient rulers. The Italian historian Nicola Di Cosmo devoted a chapter on Shiji's historical values in his monograph titled Ancient China and Its Enemies, The Rise of Nomadic Power in East Asian History. Di Cosmo emphasizes two distinctive strengths in Shiji. One is empirical, descriptive, and data-oriented. The other normative, ideological, and influenced by currents of contemporary thought. Both orientations were consistent not only with the declared goals of the historian, but also with the general thinking of an age, the early Han, inclined to the construction of the universal cosmological paradigms and unified historical patterns. These two narrative strands not only apply to Sima Qian's description on Xiongnu, but also in almost every narratives that he created, including those that are absent or far from being consistent historical narratives. 
and it is often the latter, ideological or moral strain of Sima Qian's writing that have often been overlooked. The Cosmo elaborates on the empirical nature of Shi Ji compared with its predecessors and contemporaries worldwide. Tracing the etymological origin of the classical Chinese word Tai Shi, which is grand historian, the Cosmo reveals that among almost everything that a grand historian had to take down, a modern-day de facto recorder or transcript software, the function and training as an astrologer plays a crucial role in Shi Ji's construction of a unitarian vision of the cosmos and of the principle regulating it. Therefore, the dual function of the Shi as recorder of both heavenly and human events makes sense of human experiences. The astrological knowledge is drawn from the Huang Lao tradition and the cosmological elements of Han Confucianism, in particular those linked to the Yin Yang theory but not resistant against other schools of thought. The writing style is no doubt a palimpsest of Zuo Zhuan and Chun Qiu, which for sure establish Shi Ji's didactic nature. The presence of elements belonging to different philosophical traditions and the syncretic tendencies detectable in Shi Ji are supported by Sima Qian himself, who declared in his famous letter to Zhen An that he wanted to form a single thought of thought. According to the Cosmo, to integrate the inner Asian nomads as with any other phenomenon that was truly anomalous and new in Chinese history within a unified historical frame, Inner Asia had to be understood or rationalized to both according to the intellectual canons of his own age and according to those principles of historical investigation that Sima Qian set for himself. This rationalization of Inner Asia required the seamless juncture of the history of the Xiongnu in the flow of Chinese history, following primarily the principle of comprehensiveness, which in Chinese is Tong. In addition, the investigation of the relationship between heaven and man, where man obviously had to include all the terrestrial events worthy of being recorded, required that Inner Asia be included for the first time in Chinese historiography into the system of correlations between celestial and human occurrences that formed such an important pillar of the Han thought. In Zuo Zhuan's, we have seen there are passages that can be interpreted in the sense of a temporary opposition between two opposite principles, civilization and the lack of it. But those passages certainly do not articulate a vision of history, whereby the north and the central plane are turning to two metaphysical principles eternally at war with one another, placing the northern nomads within the realm of prescriptive history, where the shape and nature of change is sourced to the intricate web of correlations at the foundations of yin and yang and five-phase thought, is evidence of a fuller appreciation of the role of the inner Asia as a genuine part of the Chinese history. Indeed, this impression is further supported by the historical reconstruction of the genealogy of the northern peoples as a principle antagonistic and yet complementary to the Huaxia civilization from its very origins. The notion of a yin-yang opposition of the two sides, the north and the south, that pervades some of the passages concerning Inner Asia appears to be a product of the Han period although possibly as a development based on the concepts of the antagonistic polarization inherited from an earlier time. The system of the allocated fields, fen ye, that is, the partitioning of the sky and earth, stemming from the cosmopolitical necessity of establishing correspondences between celestial zones and earthly regions, had developed by the Warring States period into a set of correspondences between constellations and specific Eastern Zhou states. The duty of the astronomers of the various states was to formulate prognostications relative to their kingdoms on the basis of the observations of the movements of planets and the portions of the sky, or lunar lodge assigned to each. Each lodge represented a political division of the Earth, and the astrological prognostications referred to the states includes corresponding lunar lodge astronomical phenomena were observed. However, during this period, inner Asian regions do not seem to have been included in these heavenly correspondences. Among the astrological manuscripts found at Ma Wangdui, 
a silk scroll book written according to some estimates between 403 and 206 BCE, illustrates a system of prognostications of human matters based on the shape and movement of comets. It is significant for our discussion that all the prognostications are co-related to historical events, especially miniature ones concerning the Warring States. The space beyond the political boundaries of the Xiaozhou community was simply not included in the cosmological version represented in this type of predictive astronomy. The author of the work did not seem to have believed that the inhabitants of those regions have any real bearings on the political vicissitudes of the central states. In the literature of the Han period, we find a contradictory evidence we may take into consideration. For instance, the Huainanzi, a text that reflects beliefs and conceptions about geography and ethnography that must have been current at the time of Sima Qian. In section six of chapter four of the Huainanzi, when the regions beyond nine provinces, which is beyond China, are discussed, we find again a long list of fantastic beings and strange countries. As some critics point out, these strange lands must be treated with great care, for they belong to a type of literature in which terrestrial and mythical geography blend together. But the inclusion of Inner Asian peoples in co-related metaphysical systems was not uncommon during the Han. Statesmen such as Zhao Zuo, who were actively engaged in foreign policy, referred to the northern nomads within this framework. The territory of the Hu and Mu is a place of accumulated yin, which is very cold. The tree bark is three inches thick, and they eat meat and drink kumis. The people have a thick skin, and the animals have much fur. So the nature of the people and animals is such that they're adapted to cold. The yang and the yue have little yin and much yang. Their people have a thin skin. Their birds and animals have thin furs, and their nature is to withstand heat. In Sima Qian's time, correlated correspondence could also inform the explanation of a given historical event. Even the pragmatic Zhao Zuo could reach the conclusion that the Qin garrison soldiers, being neither extremely yin nor extremely yang, were not accustomed to these climates. So the soldiers on duty died on the frontier, and those transported there died on the road. The approach to historical causality was part of the intellectual climate in which Sima Qian lived. But in the Shiji, this normative perspective is applied to Inner Asia and to the Xiongnu in a more systematic fashion, to the point that the northern nomads, especially after they acquired a far more threatening imperial dimension, became the true alter ego of China, a phenomenon that could not be ignored but needed to be addressed and made into a coherent, fully investigated agent of history. Sima Qian's inclusion of the nomadic north in a set of astrological correlations was not aimed primarily at establishing some principle of causality that would concretely offer an explanation for a given historical event, but was a way of integrating the northern nomads within the rest of the Chinese history. By making the north subject to the same rules, patterns, and laws that were thought to explain events in Chinese history. One of which was the dialectic relationship between heaven and man. He made the North be part of a universal and integrated division of history. Placing the Xiongnu in a genealogical relationship to Chinese history was probably even more important. The emergence of the Xiongnu phenomenon was explained in the context of a set of known historical categories. The various northern peoples of the old and organized into an invented genealogy that would result in the construction of a fictitious ethnic tie with the past. With the exception of the ethnic genealogy of Xiongnu, whose appearance is clearly meant to show continuity between the present and the past, the normative passages on the northern nomads are not arranged in any systematic way. However patchy their distribution within the Shiji, there is nevertheless clear evidence of an effort to transform the North from a morally unsavory and historically amorphous place into an essential component of the Chinese history. By assigning to Inner Asia certain historical and cosmological values, the historian brought Inner Asia into a wider rationalistic vision, according to which the ominous North could be explained and somehow controlled. 
This ideological operation, together with the empirical collection of data, paved the way for the incorporation of the Northern peoples into the Chinese historiographical tradition from the Shiji onward. This historiographical tradition became the repository of both Chinese and Inner Asian history. I hope you have so far enjoyed listening to the first half of this episode. If you're interested in listening to the rest of the entire episode, in which we will read along and analyze Jin Ke's famous assassination attempt of the first emperor of Qin, as is vividly described in the record of the Grand Historian, you can subscribe to our podcast at theglobalnovel.com/slash subscribe. Thank you so much for listening.